thank you thank you so much for all the intro and inviting me to do the talk um uh yeah so hello everyone my name's rich um i uh, am a research fellow at utas as mercedes was saying i'm also an honorary research fellow at cease and that's just because um i live in brisbane and uh i i sort of knew carissa and i've worked with katie on the call as well so i sort of sort of um yeah sort of try to uh, see what we could do working to, uh, working together, and 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 Chris very kindly supported my application to be an honorary research fellow at CIS as well. So that was great, and so hopefully I can be a bit more involved in, and and lots of things around UQ. Um, so anyway, yeah, this uh, this particular talk um, was sort of a a product of um, an NCS working group. So NCS is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at UCSB. Um, it's where I did my last postdoc. Um, also where Katie uh, Kimple on the call did hers as well. Um, and we were both part of a working group on uh, food systems, sustainability and impacts. Uh, and back when we could travel, um, uh, yeah, we traveled to and from Santa Barbara to uh, do this, but also a, a number of much bigger um, projects as well with, within our, uh, our time in that working group. And it was, so this was just sort of a, a, a bit of a perspective piece that we wrote because we noticed certain trends occurring within aquaculture uh, and, and a certain narrative that kept appearing everywhere. And, and so I'll we'll sort of dig into that a little bit. So I'll sort of preface the, uh, what we did with, with sort of that background a little. Um, so why, why do we care really about aquaculture? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly uh, an ecologist at heart and I spent a long time in Southeast Asia, you know, mainly because I was really interested in, in going there and working there for seeing the incredible biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, but I noticed that food production was a major driver of um, most of the environmental impacts I was seeing anyway. So I, I became more and more interested in the sort of the proximate and the ultimate drivers of, of ecosystem degradation, particularly around food systems. Um, aquaculture is a growing source of of how we source our aquatic food. So um, uh, basically every second fish that is available for consumption in the world is, is uh, farmed rather than fish now. You can see the orange there is the, is the global capture production and you can see that aquaculture since roughly the 1980s has just absolutely exploded around the world, largely in, in East and Southeast Asia. Um, that's where about 90% of the production occurs, but it is growing elsewhere as well. There's been lots of drives to increase mariculture particularly because freshwater um, will be eventually limited in, in some ways either through land uh, freshwater availability or otherwise um, <clears throat> so so aquaculture we care about its growth because it seemed to become the dominant source of fish and seafood it's important that we get it right it's a it's this burgeoning industry which um, as we've seen with many things uh, the green revolution um, included that uh, explosive expansion of food system can have a huge toll on our natural systems. It's a highly diverse sector though. So we've got um, unfed and fed systems. So unfed like your bivalves that, that generally filter feed in, in the water column. You've got um, seaweeds and you've got some that are more agricultural almost. You've got sort of here, you can see this sort of, uh, sort of uh, a rice fish paddy system where they farm fish inside, inside of, uh, of rice paddy fields. And that's very, very common throughout Southeast Asia. Um, some are highly technical systems, so some of the mariculture you might see, which is marine aquaculture um, uh, in, in Europe, around uh, Australia, um, in Norway, Chile, um, you know, highly, highly uh, uh, precise systems. For example, you have um, videos that use machine learning to understand the fish behavior and understand when they need feeding from a remote feeding station actually in town in a town somewhere and you could be you know tens of not hundreds of kilometers away from where the, the pen is uh, to others that are much more manually um, managed through um, through through manual uh, manual labor largely um, <clears throat> so it's a highly diverse sector with highly diverse impacts and so understanding its role into the future is incredibly important fed aquaculture in particular dominates the food that we get from aquaculture. A lot of aquaculture is actually this sort of 29.7% here. This is sort of uh, largely seaweeds. And most of that um, goes into food products, but we don't necessarily use it as, as, as food directly. Um, nori is the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest thing that we, we might eat on a day-to-day -day basis, certainly in Australia, you know, wrapped up around our sushi. 
but largely speaking, the things that we eat um, in terms of the, the fish, the invertebrates, uh, our shrimps and things like that, um, that tends to all be dependent on feed to, to some extent. So 70% of the fish and invertebrates that we use as food depend on human feeds. Um, <clears throat> the diets vary, of course, hugely um, across species, but uh, we'll see that is changing um, quite, quite rapidly. Um, and the most attention over the last 20 years has been sort of diverted towards this idea of fish meal and fish oil. I don't know if you've all come across the concept that we, we catch fish called what we call forage fish, um, which your anchovies and your menhaid and your herring, things like that. And they're generally um, uh, a large proportion of them anyway are ground up uh, to create fish meal and oil, which is going to not just aquaculture, but also the agricultural industries as well. And a lot of people have criticized this um, for a long period of time. Um, it's, it's emerged in many, many forums. So from uh, your more sort of uh, uh, emotive centric, I guess the word emotional, <laughs> emotionally driven um, NGOs to your um, to, uh, to very, very well renowned researchers throughout, uh, throughout the last 20 years, um, commenting on the inefficiency of feeding fish to fish that we then eat. Why don't we just eat the fish in the first place? Um, and of course, there are other uh, aspects of this, of course, taking small pelagic fish out of marine ecosystems is generally thought to be negative in terms of the trophic cascades that it can cause throughout an ecosystem. Um, Yes, and so it's attracted much uh, negative attention throughout time. So this is sort of what we're focusing on. And because of uh, the inclusion typically of, uh, of, of, of forage fish, uh, like fish meal and oil into carnivorous species feeds, particularly things like salmon, um, that tends to be the focus of saying, well, we need to move away from this high trophic level um, aquaculture towards much lower trophic levels where they don't depend on this uh, on this fish that could otherwise be used to feed people who need to eat more food um, or, and also minimize the impacts on marine ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> and, we, and you can start to see these sort of recommendations appearing in many different policy and policy adjacent documents. So, um, so uh, WWF reports uh, start uh, suggesting that, okay, we need, we need uh, to uh, more, um, uh, we need to shift to more, uh, efficient and low trophic level aquaculture to to feed the world um world resource resource institute as well um uh, a while back now but this is just some examples uh low trophic farm uh fish species are the um are the way that we need to then increase our, our fish consumption and and uh, reduce demand for these scarce wild fish resources and uh we found even a a new uh I guess Ocean Resiliency Act in California um, that was that is increasingly pushing for low trophic level mariculture, um, and so the this sort of advice is appearing more and more in in policy and uh, policy adjacent documents uh, around the world. Um, <clears throat> much of the shift has actually happened already, um, so economics has actually been a major driver of changes to what we feed our, our farmed fish. Um, the reason is, is that um, you can see on the, on the, on the left here, the graph, the, the, the gray line is basically the catch of forage fish species, these small pelagic uh, fish species. And they have basically plateaued. Uh, they're, many people suggest they're declining, but they do take large decadal um, oscillations. They're very, very variable systems. So it's hard to know exactly what the general trend at a global level is. But either way, the species that we are um, fishing in order to produce fish meal and oil have largely plateaued in their catch. We are getting more and more um, of our fish meal and oil from trimmings and discards. So uh, taking uh, even the trimmings out of aquaculture itself and, and creating fish meal and oil and, and obviously from fisheries uh, by catch as well. Um, so yeah, supply has stagnated, and that means that because demand is still increasing from a growing aquaculture sector and also um, agriculture, so it's worth noting that about 20% of global fish meal and oil actually goes to pigs. Um, so uh, that's one major source of, of, of demand too. Um, but irrespective, what's happened uh, for aquaculture is that as um, demand has increased, but supplies stayed, stayed stagnant, we can, uh, we can obviously see that the price 
generally speaking, has increased through time. So as uh, max fish meal price um, increases, you generally get this proportion um, of inclusion in feed decreasing. And what that means is that um, through time is, uh, for example, in, uh, in salmon, uh, what we've seen is this huge shift away from forage fish. So um, uh, for carnivorous species like salmon, it used to rely on something like 90% forage sort of fish meal and fish oil composition. And now you're looking more uh, between sort of uh, 15 to 25% um, of, of total marine protein and oil sources. In the feed. The rest of it is largely made up from, from plant-based sources, so crop meals and crop oils as well. But <clears throat> it struck us because we, uh, as a group, were quite aware of this shift that has been happening over the last few years, is that uh, it doesn't, it's not really clear what then does a hydrophic level fish mean? Uh, if we're talking about moving away from hydrophic level aquaculture, what do we, what do we mean by that? And so we wanted to understand, well, okay, what has been happening with the sort of effective trophic level of aquaculture? It's not really um, the trophic level because obviously these uh, most fish are artificially fed through human made uh, feeds. But what we did do is, is take some fish meal inclusion survey data. We uh, coupled that with some time point data for 2015 of agricultural byproduct, uh, byproduct inclusions, particularly um, crops and, uh, and, and um, animal byproducts. So a lot of fish are fed things like feather meal and other waste products that come out of agricultural processing. And we interpolated um, some of that point data to get sort of temporal data throughout the same time period as, as the fish meal inclusion survey data. We also took um, uh, some the production data from the FAO uh, of different uh, different taxa of of farm species, and we combined all of that to try and to create our own sort of database of like, well, okay, this is this is roughly in 1995. This is what a carp, on average, may have eaten in terms of its fish meal and oil inclusion, its um, its animal byproduct inclusion, and its crop inclusion in the feeds. And each one of those we designated a particular trophic level. Um, uh, I think it was we gave animal byproduct inclusion the maximum of 2.1, which represents roughly chicken, um, because a lot of it is actually much lower. So it might be, uh, it might be two because um, a lot of the byproduct that goes in is from completely herbivorous livestock. So, you know, bone meal from, from cattle, for example. And we did that for 11 main taxa, which represent over 90% of fed aquaculture species. So that is the carps, the tilapias, catfishes, milkfishes, um, through eels, crustaceans, um, salmons, trouts, and other marine fishes. Um, <clears throat> and what we also wanted to know is, well, okay, if we change, if we just change the composition of, uh, of, of what has been happening through time. So obviously what we've been farming through time has, has, has changed. And we wanted to understand the effect of, 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 just, of just the species composition change through time. We wanted, to, we wanted to understand the effect of what, uh, if, if, if of the change of inclusion of feed ingredients on the trophic level of fed aquaculture through time. And the other thing we realized would also affect the trophic level of the fed aquaculture itself is the forage fish species. What they, uh, which species were caught, what trophic level they were, which we pulled out of fish base. And, and we got that as a, as a time series through time as well. Um, and we use this all, we use basically, it's, it's I can't remember, it was 200 and something species of fish that are, are probably included within fish meal and oil production um, uh, at, at a global level and their relative uh, trophic level through time. So um, we, we wanted to do a sensitivity analysis to understand uh, the change in trophic level uh, at, uh, in, in total of the Fed sector, but also the, the role of these different, um, these different aspects in terms of the, the effect on trophic level. Um, <clears throat> and what we did is uh, we, we found that if you, once you, in, you, in, you account for the species that we farm changing, the, what we feed them changing, and the trophic level of the fish that go into those feeds as well, then we found that the effective trophic level of fed agriculture, which is this dark blue line, has, has, has declined um, through time. So it's decreased from about 2.6 in aggregate in 1995 to about 2.2 in 2015. <clears throat> but what we found is if, if you keep everything else the same, but you allow the, uh, as 1995 values, but you allow the species composition to change as it has done through time, 
or you allow this, the fluctuation in the trophic level of the forage fish themselves to fluctuate through time, then it doesn't really have a huge effect on the trophic level of the fed, fed aquaculture sector in total. Um, <clears throat> And uh, but but if you just allow the the forage fish inclusion within the feeds, well, all ingredients do to to change. But the main thing driving it is the forage fish because forage fish trophic levels are usually three and upwards. Um, uh, then it very very closely matches what we have observed. Well, what we we have estimated to observe through time, and so largely speaking, the forage fish. Um, the inclusion of forage fish and the, the reduction in that has been the main thing that's been driving reductions in the effective trophic level of the fed, fed aquaculture sector um, uh, overall. And that makes sense. If we look back at some salmon uh, sort of feeds, this is what this, this, this little inset plot is showing, that the marine protein and marine, marine oil component of feeds have really, really dropped off through time. And so it's these that are driving a decline in um, effective trophic level of the fed sector. And these feed shifts have it, it basically blurred the trophic position of a lot of the species that we, we farm. So the effective trophic levels of most taxa are now far lower than their wild counterparts. So <clears throat> the box plots here, excuse me, are uh, the, the greeny block, uh, box plots are the uh, sort of a range of um, uh, trophic levels from, from this particular taxa of, of wild species that are also farmed. And um, they're not, they, they represent the, the wild trophic level. We don't have temporal data for that, um, but that is, that is an estimate coming out of, of fish base. And that's the variability among it. So from our estimates though, that, that's the blue line of the farm species. So you can see that for most farm species, um, uh, the, the, the effective trophic level has now become far lower than their wild counterparts. Um, we estimate, in fact, that in, even in 1995, when a lot of species were using um, forage fish, fish meal and oil um, in their feeds in a big way, then the, uh, the, trophic level, the effective trophic level would have probably been lower in many ways as well. This is kind of a, a, an interesting point, because if you think about a lot of the time, something like salmon gets a lot of rap for using so many fish and it's very inefficient. But actually think about what the, the wild salmon that you're eating is, is also doing. Um, and, and actually much less efficiently because it's also diverting a lot of those resources to migrating, reproducing. Uh, and so the, the feed efficiency of those wild species are, is actually much lower as well. Um, uh, what we see particularly is things like freshwater, uh, uh, these other freshwater species, so bass, perch, snakeheads, they've dropped a whole lot. Um, so the effective trophic level uh, uh, dropping by about 0.7 points there. Um, something like a marine fish or a salmon. So salmon's dropping basically a whole trophic level um, through time because of the shifts in ingredients. <clears throat> and so trophic levels and, and their positions are increasingly blurred because with a lot of herbivorous species, um, so things like carps, tilapias, they are still fed small amounts of fish meal, for example, because, and even fish oil in some circumstances, um, because one, it, sometimes it's just a local convention. That's what you feed your fish. Some people believe that it's going to um, give them a, a greater growth advantage as well, certainly in the, um, in the more juvenile stages. Um, <clears throat> and so what we're doing is we're farming naturally herbivorous species as omnivores. And we're, we're farming because we're now shifting away from forage fish ingredients for uh, carnivorous species. We're farming them as, herbivore, uh, as omnivores too. And so what's happening is this sort of... Uh, this, this uh, sort of coalescing of trophic levels. Um, and, and it sort of really blurs this meaning of what, what does high trophic level even mean and how do we move away from it? Um, <clears throat> not only that is that trophic levels emit important aspects of efficiency that contribute to the sustainability of a farm system. So um, fat agriculture in general has become more efficient since 1995. We look here, the feed conversion ratio, that is the amount of feed going in relative to the amount of biomass you get out of the, uh, uh, of the farm uh, species has been decreasing. So obviously we want to put less in and get more out. So um, that's been decreasing through time for basically all farm taxa. So, um, and, and it's been moving down this Y axis, generally speaking. Some of the most efficient you can see down here, salmon, trouts, 
some catfishes. This is uh, actually a dominated uh, attacks are dominated by things like Pangasius, what you might see in the shop labeled as Bassa. Um, so they're actually they're they're sort of more they're they're more omni omnivorous naturally than the herbivorous some of the herbivorous species. But they're also very efficient in terms of their feed conversion ratios. And so that's an important aspect uh, that trophic levels completely emits. And if you notice through time, in, if we take the values for 1995, 2005, 2015, is that we're getting this tighter distribution of uh, both the trophic level and the feed conversion ratios of many farm species. And so again, it's very hard to understand that there are trade-offs there between the efficiency and the trophic level of the species. Not only that, is that um, some of uh, something like a salmon, for example, may actually retain key nutrients like proteins. We know things like um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids as well. It will retain those much more efficiently than, than other species. And so um, it, the, the use of trophic level as a metric of sustainability is, is kind of complex and inefficient in its own way for, for those reasons. So taxa are coalescing at these similar trophic levels and converging efficiencies. Uh, the other thing that it doesn't tell us is for a trophic level, if we start putting crops into, into feed in a much bigger way, is that better? And if it is, why? Because we actually don't know, um, you know, a, a, a bad agricultural, a, a poorly managed agricultural system uh, can be as bad, if not far worse in, for biodiversity or and other metrics than a well-managed fishery, for example. And so those trade-offs need to be considered um, uh, in terms of how we judge the sustainability of our seafood. The other key, uh, key thing that trophic levels don't account for is this global picture of, of demand. And that is that there is this huge increase in demand uh, for seafood, uh, efficient seafood around the world. Um, it's, it's doubled, uh, over doubled uh, at a global level uh, since 1960. As we look between 1993 to 2013, many countries have increased their per capita supply of seafood by over 20 kilos. People are eating 20 kilos per year more in the just in in a in a um, in a 20 year period. But the other thing is that there is this huge demand as people um, uh, come into the a burgeoning uh, middle class uh, around the world because people are becoming wealthier um, in in big step changes as well that you get this huge demand for high value species, particularly shrimp, lobster, salmon. And that's a really important dynamic because we can, um, we can suggest, okay, that we need this low trophic level mariculture or low trophic level freshwater aquaculture. But these developing and emerging economies will have more and more global influence in terms of creating production incentives. And these production incentives are very, very important because a lot of decisions for growth are driven by corporate decisions because a lot of high value aquaculture systems are uh, dominated by private companies. And so where there is a production incentive, the demand will be met. It's sort of, from my perspective, it's just, just putting a, we need to grow more low trophic level aquaculture is sort of like taking an aspirin for, your, uh, for a headache that's driven by dehydration. It's a, it's a short term, it's maybe a short term thing. We're not, we're treating the symptom and not the cause. And so pushes for unfed species like more mussels, eating more seaweed and things like that are, um, th they're, they're good on paper, but will they serve as substitutes for um, what we currently eat? I, I remain unconvinced of that at, at present. Um, dietary changes are incredibly hard to implement and certainly just blanket saying, well, we need low trophic level aquaculture doesn't really get to um, some of the problems that are underpinning it. Um, <clears throat> and particularly because we have a slight, um, at a national level anyway, it's something that I, I like to call uh, uh, seafood hypocrisy. Um, and that is that, uh, and not that people are necessarily being uh, hi hi hypocritical, but at a national level, we do appear to be. Uh, and that's that social acceptance of the aquaculture, for example, in, in Australia, has caused a lot of growth to falter. And that's largely because we, a lot of it is dominated around um, uh, South Australia and Tasmania. And I looked at a whole load of headlines and we, um, uh, that have come out of one year's worth of um, headline, news headlines about aquaculture around Australia, and I sort of split it up by state. And I used uh, sentiment analysis 
um, paired with someone else who sort of, we, we did this independently and we came up with these general ideas of sentiment towards aquaculture. <clears throat> and uh, what we found is that the, the general sentiment towards aquaculture was overwhelmingly negative in Tasmania, less, uh, less so, but second most, uh, second most negative in South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, ACT, et cetera, as you can see. And that in, aligned all, uh, like, absolutely beautifully with the proportion of domestic aquaculture production uh, that that state represents. Um, and so uh, aquaculture is very, very unpopular in the places where it occurs. People often don't want to see the impacts of food production. Um, yet salmon uh, remains, this is a paper from Jessica uh, Bogart um, from 2019, remains one of the most popular and singular seafood items in Australia. So it's sort of second only to tuna. Also uh, highly resource intensive to farm fish and otherwise, same as prawns. Um, and so there is this hypocrisy at a national level, at least, of that we eat certain things, but yet um, we don't necessarily want to see these impacts in our local waters, or those impacts need to be managed better at a national level, which is uh, probably probably a little bit of column A, a little of column B. Um, and of course, that means that when um, our production, which we can see on this bottom plot here, which is a uh, this gray line here is our total seafood production, aquaculture, the light blue, fisheries, the darker blue. When our total production um, is so far below what we're actually consuming, a lot of that consumption uh, burden is then put onto our trade partners and the ecosystems of our trade partners. And it's really a, a threat to sustainability in those systems as well. <clears throat> So we need to address this mismatch between the policy of like, we need this, this, uh, this low trophic level uh, aquaculture and, and um, you know, what we're actually eating and what people will go for. So really, yeah, are there an alternative? You know, we need to sort of specify some alternatives. Well, from my perspective anyway, and certainly that of, of my co-authors is that the, the best way out of, 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 uh, of a confusing policy um, perspective is is using voluntary certification schemes. Um, they're important because they assess, assess not only sustainability at a farm level, they look through the entire the entire value chain as well. And of course, there are important considerations within that. Obviously, there's equity and uh, and uh, uh, and nutritional considerations to think about. Um, is the is the fish nu uh, nutritious? Who's getting those benefits? Um, are there, is there slave uh, or forced labor inside those value chains? Um, environmental, of course, is not just, you know, what, it, what is the, the greenhouse gas emissions coming out of a, of a kilo of protein from this particular thing? Environmental sustainability is far more complex than that. Um, biodiversity indicators are obviously one of those things, but you've got acidification and eutrophication potential and a, a number of, of metrics that need to be considered as well. And, and of course, economic is, is, the, is the sector fit for purpose for what it is designed to do. And does it meet a range of seafood needs from high value to low value to domestic to trade, et cetera. There are a lot of problems with these certification schemes, for example, in, the, in a lot of places, particularly in the areas where, that produce the majority of our farm seafood around the world. Uh, there really isn't a lot of benefit for a producer taking part in these certification schemes uh, because one, there's a high upfront cost of joining to these certification programs. And two, there's not a lot of demand necessarily for um, certified seafood. However, uh, a lot of that demand is changing into the future. And I think uh, a big part of that is government is supporting a lot of aquaculture growth around the world in, in many, many different countries. And if, if there can be support for startup costs for certification, I think it will be uh, a really important aspect of, of, of growth into the future. Um, so yeah, sort of in summary, I wanted to sort of just sort of leave you with the idea that low trophic level aquaculture is, is, is an ambiguous uh, concept and it's something that is easily advocated for um, and increasingly so. Um, but it's, it's kind of complex to, to apply trophic level to aquaculture at, in a blanket way. It depends. It's highly variable. Trophic, the effect of trophic level of a farm species is highly variable. It depends on what is being fed to them, how it's being fed to them, and how efficient the animals are as well um, in terms of converting that feed into food. Uh, and it doesn't account for uh, numerous other important sustainability considerations that we need to think about uh, if we're going to plan a very sustainable seafood sector nutrient retention and feed efficiencies. Um, uh, and of course, you know, 
if you say to someone, well, it's a really high, we're not going to accept that form of, um, uh, of, of salmon or shrimp because it's got fish meal used in its feed, that, and, and that bumps up its trophic level. That in a way is, is counterintuitive in many aspects because um, actually using things like the trimmings from aquaculture or from fisheries uh, bycatch, that uh, is far more efficient in terms of our resource use than then growing something for purpose um, and you know creating a more circular economy out of aquaculture is going to be very important and that might not be a, a clear way of, of, of understanding efficiency through trophic level um, so we need greater support for more nuanced assessments and i think uh, uh, certification schemes are certainly our best bet at the moment um, but i'll i'll leave it there and if anyone wants to add anything or ask questions, please feel free.